Continuing our initiative to revisit Tagore's vision, which, as many of you all know, had cropped out of the book written by Professor Shushantu Dattagupta, former Vice Chancellor of Vishwabharati. We have been running a series of, uh, what shall we say, uh, little, little chat shows with different people from different walks of life, academics. So far, we have had two academics. Dr. Martin Kemchin and Dr. Dipankar Dashgupta, in our urge to re-look at the vision that Tagore had set for all of us, and to what extent have we been able to keep to the vision or digressed or taken a re-look at it. So today we have with us a uh, very eminent historian, art historian, Dr. R. Shivakumar, and um, if we all uh, can just recall that one of the three major uh, pillars of Tagore's vision, uh, he had very many, but I'm just looking at some of the uh, brands, as we call it. There was Sriniketan, there was Patabhavan, there was Kalabhavan, and um, Mr. Shiva Kumar has been very closely associated with Kalabhavan for years together, and he has made Shantiniketan his home. So let's go straight into the chat, and let's uh, hear what he has to say regarding the vision of Tagore as it stands today. Well, uh, now that both of you all are here for my show, let me start by asking you that how important has Kala Bhavan been as a part of Tagore's great vision, you know, that grand vision board which we have been talking, which we are thinking of revisiting. Um, Kala Bhavan has been a very major focal point in this vision. So with both of you all, I think it's your turn to speak and ask to listen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it was very important for Tago's idea of education and also for Tago's idea of building a community. Because these two things, in my mind, were closely interconnected in his scheme of things. Uh, it started much before Kalabhan was founded, when the school was there. Uh, there were elements of art which he had already brought in. There was always an art teacher in Padabhavan. I mean, those were days where you normally didn't have art teachers in schools. And some of the students who were there, the most famous being Mughal Dey, who became later an artist of repute. So it was already there, and he had already thought about a museum much before Kalamon had started. So these were in his scheme of things quite early on. And he was uh, entering into the area of art uh, through his nephews and through Havel, because the time Kalabon was started or just, or I mean, the Padabon was started and just uh, a couple of years from then, there was this step taken by E.B. Havel and Abhinendranath to change the curriculum in the Government Art College to develop a kind of art which was going to question the academic art training that was given in India. And it is through their agency that Rabindranath begins to really think about art seriously. Before that, he was more or less uh, going with the flow of people from his social position, the way they looked at art. But around this time, he started seriously thinking about art practice in India. And his own experience as a writer told him that even what Abhinendranath was doing 
was not sufficient. It had to really be much broader than that. So his ideas started growing from about uh, 1904, five onwards. And he was trying to push both Abhinantranath and Gaganantranath to broaden their practices, which unfortunately it didn't happen the way he wanted. So uh, that is where he kind of zeroes in on Nandalal as the possible candidate. And he thinks about starting an art school in Shantinagata. So from about 1945 till about 1919, he was toying with this idea and he did various things like starting the Vijitra Club in Chaura Sango and so on and so forth and getting the Japanese artists come to India. I mean, earlier they were already there, but then he, when he goes in 1916, he also sends someone from there to come and work in Calcutta and so on. And he gets interested in what he sees in Japan. And he thought that could be a model for how art and society can connect. And he wanted to replicate something like that in Shantaniketan. That's where Kalabon comes in. Nandalal from Calcutta to Shantaniketan. Uh, so Nandalal would become his collaborator. But you can see that even before that, there were two activities of his besides teaching in uh, Padabhavan. He also took classes. All students have written about it. So besides that, I think the major part of his educational work was also his songs and his plays. So these were two instruments that he used to build a certain kind of person that he wished to see, I mean, develop and grow in this community. And he wanted artists to be part of that. So Kalabon became part of not only creating the kind of art he wanted to see develop in India, but also the kind of community he wanted to see develop in Shantaniketa. So well, that yeah makes it very important. Well, it is. That's that, that's really. Uh, I think you have laid it out very clearly and with the landmarks about uh, Nandulal Bose's reason to come to. And that very important was that the his his concept of the plays, the theatre, and music also blends with the uh, with, with the art and. Uh, do you think, like, you know, Abhinandanath is uh, considered to be, uh, you know, uh, what they say is the Bengal school of art, whatever. Um, Abhinandanath, some say that he actually is the, uh, the forerunner to Picasso because of his cubic, uh, I mean, you know, the various uh, perceptions about not so very knowledgeable people. But uh, where do you think this uh, Tago's art, where, did, where, where does this fit in? Yeah, um, that came much later because although we know from his writings, he was always interested in art. He tried his hand at drawing or painting and whatever, but he was never satisfied with it. And he thought he could never be an artist. That was one thing he was almost certain of. But this engagement with art and the kind of art that India should produce or the kind of artists that India should produce. That gradually led him to look at art across the world. So the first serious engagement, I mean, he was always looking at art whenever he traveled, but the first serious engagement was in 1916 when he went to Japan. That doesn't mean that he was not looking at European art before that point of time, he was, in fact, he was probably the first Indian to seriously look at modern art because he had this opportunity in 1913 when he was in Chicago, the big armory show, which actually changed the attitude to modern art in America itself. That was going on at Chicago and he, I, 
saw that certainly because he was lecturing there. He read Chitra there. And the next day we know that he said, I'm going back again to look at the exhibition. And at that point of time, the Armory show was in the Chicago Art Institute. So he certainly saw that. That was the biggest exposition of modern art anywhere up to that point. So he was familiar with it even before he went to Japan. And he was thinking seriously about art from letters to Abhinendranath and so on from 1912. I mean, we understand that he was looking at Rodha, for instance. He was appreciating him and so on. But this 1916 was a turning point because he realized that great art need not be all very realistic. And gradually that from the intermingling of the decorative and the narrative representational in Japanese art, he then got a point of entry into modern art. And he was also at the same time looking at uh, primitive art from across the world, partly through books, partly through interactions with uh, scholars and partly through museum visits. So all this came together to change his understanding of art. Because in the beginning, when he tried to draw, he was trying to draw in a more realistic manner. And he realized rightly that he doesn't have the skills for that. But once he was getting to know all these other art traditions, he realized that he has certain talent because rhythm is central to them. And the control of line is an important factor, which he had as a writer. And as a writer who had a beautiful hand, he knew how to control the line, how to make variations in the line, how to accentuate, stop, continue rhythms and all that. He had an innate sensibility for that. And he saw that some of these art traditions, like the Japanese, the primitive, and some modern artists, actually utilize the same kind of skills and sensibilities. So that transformed his understanding of art and that gave him an entry into art. So he realized that he can also be an artist using those different parameters. So that is where he really comes in and took a long time. And if you go through his manuscripts, he was always scribbling, but about 1904 onwards, the scribbles started becoming a little different. And the more he got to know these other traditions, you can see reflections of that in the scribbles. And finally, maybe by 1920 or 23, you can see the sometimes the poems are completely erased and you have a whole page full of scribbles or an image. So basically, he erased the writing and created an image. So that was the starting point in a way. And uh, I think the point at which this happened was a particular page in Rakta Karubi manuscript around uh, 1923, end of 23 maybe, one of the manuscripts of that. That is where probably something like this happened for the first time. And of course, then people started seeing this. Uh, Victoria Campo, for instance, saw those some of these erasers and she thought they had an image quality and an artistic value. But he still took four years. I mean, it was only in 28 that actually he stopped scribbling and doing what we call painting, that kind of thing. So it took him a while, yeah. All right, now this is a question to both of you. Uh, post Tagore, and as we discussed that Kala Bhavan was an integral part of her, uh, uh, the vision that Tagore had, uh, everybody does, I mean, everybody is open to art and teaching and learning. And this was all cocktailed, you know, from part of Bhavan to Kala Bhavan and so and so forth, and his dance, theater, music. Uh, is that legacy still being carried on? What, uh, or up to a point, did that essence and ethos of Kala Bhavan continue? And is it still continuing even now? 
or has the vision gone slightly diluted somewhere with everything else that is also, you know, it's after all, uh, the, you know, that will have an impact on the overall situation. And um, uh, so where, where does that uh, vision of Kala Bhavan, which is a very, very important landmark, everybody, you talk Kala Bhavan, oh yes, and so, and everybody knows about uh, uh, Nandolal Bose, everybody knows about Ram King Kaur. So, you know, that's a very much talked about kind of a thing. But where does it, did it subsequently what happened? That's the, and what will, how will we take it forward from there? That, those are the two issues I want to, I want you all to react. Well, uh, Sivagumar is pointing to me, but before we address this particular uh, question that you raised, I would like to amplify that Shivakumar had made certain very significant points. And, and these are the following as I absorb them. A, that even when the Brahmacharya school uh, was being enacted by Tagore, this is from nine, after 1900 when he moved to Shanti Niketan, which eventually became part of one. That was a formality, the name given in 1925, that he already had people like Mukulde come and teach. No, he was a student. Uh, and, and he was a student. Yeah. And, and then, of course, yeah. uh, he blossomed into an artist yeah. later on. So, uh, and the other point that uh, I think Shivakumar made, if you remember, since we are also discussing the book, uh, I tried to, in my own view, divide uh, this last one, one half of his life in Shanti Nikitan, because he was born in 19... 61. He moved at the age of 40 and he lived for another nearly 40 years. And so uh, the first the, the first phase was prolific writer Tagore was. But then the second phase, which is roughly starting around 1915, 1916, which is actually what Shivakumar mentioned also as one of the turning points as far as Tagore's um, idea about art evolved. Uh, then Tagore becomes a universal man. So uh, this question, uh, this is one point about universality that, you know, he was imbibing art forms of different cultures, the, the Eastern culture of Japan, a uh, little bit maybe of China and our own um, Ajanta, Ilora, et cetera. And then also uh, the European art. So it's, a, it's the amalgamation of ideas from various sources, uh, which, which never... Uh, had any uh, any barrier for him as far as national borders were concerned. So this is one important point again that Shivakumar mentioned that you know this is a universal Tagore. So I my my period was 1916-15 to 1930, where he also is traveling a lot, and uh, so Shivakumar mentioned his travels to uh, Japan and Europe, etc. Uh, when he was exposed and uh, as well as up to America, in fact. Uh, so, and at, this is the time when he's also writing to his own son about the plan to have a school and a university here called Vishwabharati. So, uh, so therefore, having art as part of education, as unitary education, holistic education, was a unique concept of Tagore, that, that education is incomplete unless you have art, music, drama, everything together, as well as, of course, uh, viewing nature through open-air class, etc. So this is another point about the, the vision of Tagore, that education is all-encompassing, in which art plays a role. As he mentioned, Kusha Shiva Kumar, that, that you know, the, um, when Tagore started Kalabhavan, he had Sangeet also as part of the Kalabhavan in 1919. Later on in the early 1930s, the two were, got separated. And he had Nandalal Bose to spearhead it. Uh, but I don't remember, because Shivakumar knows it much better, that others like uh, Somnath Hor, Binod Bihari, Mukhopadhyay, Ram King Pirbej, they all joined this activity maybe later on. But Nandalal Bose was really his, uh, his right hand man as far as Kalavabhavan was concerned. And uh, then, of course, uh, Sogit Bhavan uh, in 1930 got uh, split from Kala Bhavan. But the, the two are contiguous. And I think his idea was that the two should be very close together. Uh, the the Kalobari uh, 
uh, is in fact just at the juxtaposition of uh, Kala and Sanghi. So this this is also part of the vision. Uh, so A, universal Tagore. B, having Kala and Sangeet as part of an holistic educational system, interfacing with the community. Students will go out and, and visit the Santal villages and, and sketch things, etc. So this is all part of the community bonding as well. And that is a vision. So uh, so this is this is where uh, I think the points that Professor Shivakumar made are very important. And uh, and also, of course, uh, as he said, what he called scribbles and what Maybe Ocampo called doodles or whatever, and then and then I think the uh, uh, he was spurred into becoming a formal artist by none other than Victoria Ocampo in 1924, and as Professor Kumar said, by 1928 he is an accomplished artist. Uh, I I have one question to Professor Kumar later on, but maybe we discuss the issue that you raised about Tagorean vision and how. Is it relevant today? Is it uh, living there or is it living inside Kalabhavan or even outside Kalabhavan? Just now, Professor Shiva Kumar did a, an exhibition in Kolkata and in Shantiniketan. It's going elsewhere, I believe, on Binod Vihari Mukhopadhyay and, and he has done other exhibits which are which have nothing to do with Vishwabharata. So uh, that's just another point that I think uh, we can have him talk about his view that the vision is so big that it need not be perhaps constrained within a centrally funded, publicly funded institution, but it can go elsewhere, maybe. So I'll stop here and let Professor Shivakumar speak. Yeah. Um, well, I was trying to uh, hint at the idea for Rabindranath, education had a purpose and the purpose was to create a new kind of man or woman for a new kind of society. So initially it started against the background of the Sodeshi, which he saw as certain weaknesses of Sodeshi. And when he was working in his family estates, one of the things he no we notice is that at a time when nobody else was talking about, none of the nationalists were talking about, he was trying and thinking seriously of how to bridge the gap between the city and the rural kind of thing, between the educated urban people and the peasants in the village. This was a central thing. And so his starting of Vishwabharati, I mean, not at that point of time, part of the school, was partly to create a person who will be sympathetic who will be educated, who will have all the resources of modern education, but will also be sympathetic to the peasants, their problems, the rural issues and so on. And he talks about it first, even before he really does it very seriously in Shantaniketan. He talks about it in a national Congress meeting. I mean, uh, that was, I think, 1908, where he says, in fact, something which is very unusual at that point of time, that the necessity of unionizing the peasants and getting them together to uh, understand their problems and also fight for their problems. I mean, this we wouldn't normally expect Tagu to speak along these lines, but he did speak in one of the National Congress meetings. And so he had at the back of his mind to create this new kind of people who be empathetic, I mean, to the, I mean, to the community and its needs. And so one of the things he was trying to get children in the school do by making them learn from nature and in a rural setting, was to be not only sensitive and use nature as the source of learning, but also to create a group of people who will be empathetic to village, village life, its problems and so on. Now, add to that, which I said that he was doing with his own music and theater, is to sensitize them to aspects of nature through songs and 
introduced them to various social problems and issues through theater. So if you look at all his theater, this quality is there. And that is what he also wanted Kalama an artist to do. In a sense, to bring art out of the, out of the studios, to make it part of the community, to use both music, theater, and art to create a community which is not divided along ideologies, along religions, and will be able to. So, I mean, very often people criticize him for his attitude being very, uh, I mean, kind of emotional, idealistic, romantic, putting stress on emotions more than intellect. But it is only through emotions that we can bond with people. So that aspect of art was very important to him. And only if we feel emotionally connected, we can overcome the other divisions. So whether it was the imagination of the festivals and so on, we can see that he was also thinking of how to build a secular society. And that was important. So the art and culture had to play a role in creating that society. And all the early artists of Shantaniketan did that whether it was Nandalal. In fact, I mean, uh, uh, Shambhamitra, I heard him once say that it was through Nandalal's drawings that I learned about the body language of a peasant. Now, that is an important thing. Or think about uh, Ram Pinker, his sculptures. Now, it's for the first time that a simple tribal peasant is created in this large size, monumental. I mean, he occupies a very central position in the landscape. Now, we don't have any image in Indian art before his, which does some even come close to that. So there was a lot of things that was happening here through the arts, which might not have been, people might not have been conscious of it. And this is probably what Shrobindranath wanted that without being fully conscious of it, you are being changed. So arts played a big role in that. And I think between 1920 and maybe 48, or till at least independence, Shantiniketan probably was the most creative space in India. So it did have a big role. Uh, of course, there were also problems which many people have done, including Shushandada in his book, that after Tagu's death, uh, there was an element of conservatism that came into Shantinikedan, and it also affected Kalabon. Even somebody like Nandalal, who was very, very innovative, he became, there were two reasons. One, he was also growing old, and he thought the people who were in charge after Tagu was sort of not keeping up the ideas as much as Rabindranath did. And it was time for him to retire. So he thought one of the things he should do is to conserve what has been achieved. Of course, trying to conserve something that you've already achieved can also make you a little rigid. Now, that did happen. And uh, with the rest of Kalabha, I mean, Vishwabharati, Kalaban also suffered from that to some extent. But the difference was that Kalaban always found a way back. So it went on. The decline did take place. I mean, immediately after independence, Binod Bihari, who was probably the most I mean, thoughtful I mean, uh, student of Nandalal and who Stella Pramrish kind of once described as a born teacher, I mean, he left because he thought he was being slightly sidelined. And um, so he left. He came back in 58, of course. And there was Ram Kinga. But the trinity that actually shaped Kalabhavan and its art, they became sort of individuals and dismantled. That whole uh, thing went away. So that was the case, but you can see by 70s, there were new people coming. I mean, like Somnath who came in and uh, so did others who didn't actually belong to Shantiniketan in that sense. They were not the students here. So there some fresh 
blood and some fresh ideas came. Including K.J. Subramanian. Yeah, later. a little later, K.J. Subramanian, who was a very important figure. I mean, being a student here in the 40s. So all these people came and lifted up Kalaban once again. So Kalaban was fortunate in having people coming into it at certain points of crisis and then giving it another lease of life. So it hasn't fared as badly as certain other aspects of Vishwabharati, I mean, fared later. Okay, and now can I come to the last and important question? What you said was certainly very encouraging. You said that uh, despite all the troubles, uh, when things went down, Kalabhavan had his way of sort of coming back into the into the focus and into the game. But now comes the, as I said, the most important and cardinal question, where now? And where now means that how are we going to take this future? Will Kalabhavan still be coming back? And now, if Kalabhavan keeps coming back on its own by, you know, uh, changes, new people coming in, the the blend, the alignment that Tagore had dreamt, you know, of Sangeet Bhavan and uh, the others all coming together for uh, all of the others may not be in that same trip of coming back, as you said. So uh, one Kalabhavan coming back, others not coming back, other issues around that. How will so where is now? This this is the important thing. Where do we go from here? That is a very difficult question. I mean, really, uh, one can't be too sure about how it will develop. Uh, it still has a place on the Indian art scene. But I should also say that probably there's a kind of crisis in the Indian art scene. And also there is a crisis in the university system at the moment. So Kalavan, whether it will be able to escape that crisis, two crises, in fact, one which belongs to art and another which belongs to the university system. So if we can escape both these things, we can't really predict. Uh, but right at the moment, it is not doing too badly. But uh, how that will come, I can't really say. Uh, from my own uh, kind of perspective, the kind of the state in which Indian universities are today, including Vishwabharati, is not very encouraging. And uh, that is one of the things. Uh, some of the problems are inherent to Vishwabharati. Some of the problems are there coming from the, the situation as a whole. Because one of the things that Rabindranath did, and I think that was very important, that he played a very crucial role in selecting people. But once he selected them, they had a lot of freedom. He didn't interfere with it as probably the governments, the UGC does today. And more interference you have, the teachers become immaterial. So I think that is one of the problems. So even if you have good teachers, if they don't have the freedom to function, to kind of design the kind of courses, education, and the methods they need, then I don't think it is going to help, uh, even if you have good, very good teachers. I mean, so that is a problem I thing that we are facing today, but maybe in the next few years that might pass away and we might have a slightly more, I mean, uh, open, more kind of conducive atmosphere, but at this moment, we can't really predict it. I think uh, Sujit Sivakumar uh, really hit the nail on its head. Uh, if you think of Tagorean vision, uh, to me at least, if you leave out uh, Sriniketan, which is uh, one of his fantastic visions in uh, community bonding, the most the core visions were centered around Matabhavan, Kalabhavan, and Sangeet uh, But then there are umpteen number of other departments which have come into being because we are a university today. We have an act, we have statute, UGC, 
and a knack, net qualification. I mean, it is preposterous to imagine that Binod uh, Bihari Mukhopadhyay or Nandalal Bosu will be subjected to net qualification or even doing a PhD, I mean, Ramkinkar Bage and others. So this is this coexistence with the university system has its problems, which I think he had already indicated. Uh, this is something that the parliamentarians discussed, uh, and that is, uh, you know, talked about in the book Threadbare. So, uh, so this is this is of course a problem that when you have many other departments, including my own uh, discipline, physics, chemistry, and chemistry, etc. I mean, they they, they don't gel with uh, this core vision of Sangeet Kala and part of it. So. Uh, so this is this is something that it's a struggle, and how we cope with it is only time will tell. But I think Shivakumar has also, in in addition to the internal issues, which are uh, related to indigenous activities here, uh, he has put it in the context of the larger uh, ailing that the universities are going through with all kinds of rules, regulations imposed on us. And once you have that, um, I mean, the, the, then the academic freedom that he talked about is lost. So this is this is quite quite important, I think. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. uh, very honestly, this discussion that we just had, and uh, I must thank both of you all for, uh, you know, you all have actually spelt out a lot of things very clearly and there's been no i i have one i have one sujit if you permit me yeah, please, question please, yeah, please, please. you know uh, this is this is my impression tagore uh, was very deeply involved in sangeet rabindra sangeet and you know in fact he took his troops also to places like sri lanka uh, and as you mentioned drama musical drama and, uh, and especially inspired by Buddhism later on, like Shap Mochun, Chandalika, um, yeah. Notri Puja, etc. But Tagore is an artist who was viewed around 1924-28, I believe, as, as a really a modern artist of, of, uh, of the French uh, Revolution type or whatever. But uh, uh, I somehow I get the impression that Tagore left or the, the 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 looking after the art and the collaboration to his decide I mean his very close collaborators like Nongalal Bosu and others, uh, and he he didn't really, well if I may use the word push himself to start a Tagorean school of art maybe in collaboration is that it is that a realistic uh, statement? Yeah, it is. But I suppose that he didn't want to produce even a Tagorean. Uh, school of music or uh, kind of theater, he would have been quite happy to have a diversity coming. So I, I have a feeling that it is the people in the music and in the theater and so on who sort of fossilized Tagore after his, because he was experimenting. And uh, in fact, uh, the dancers whom he preferred sometimes were people not professionally trained, mm -hmm. like this Vasudevan, who is a Tamil man who just came here. And uh, Tagore created, he saw that this man had a talent for dancing, not in any, in any conventional way, but maybe like modern dancers. And he created certain things, keeping him in mind. So he was open to that. And even this uh, Ruth, I mean, uh, what was the name, Dennis, mm -hmm. when she was in Calcutta, he really went backstage and asked her if she would come and teach in uh, Shantiniketan. Mm -hmm. So he was very open to these ideas, yeah. which somehow doesn't get reflected in the way music and dance developed here. Mm -hmm. In Kalaho and too, he did that. Like Nandalal, who had a very strong nationalist strain in him, he was sometimes not as open to the West as Tagore would have liked. I mean, not that he didn't understand, but he was not, I mean, he was consciously shunning the West a little bit because of the nationalistic struggle that he was going through. 
But then Tagore made it a point to get Stella Cambridge, who is a European trained art historian, to come and lecture about Western art in Shantaniketan at a time that when nobody was doing anything like that. So, and he also said that all the teachers and students should attend the lectures. Mm -hmm. And he himself attended those lectures. And in fact, initially because her English was, I mean, had a heavy German accent, he used to translate her lectures for the listeners. So he did make sure that the contact with the West also developed in Shankalabhon, which helped, I think, without uh, somebody like her and the lectures that she gave, we would not have had a person like Binod Bihari, who was a very perceptive art writer as well. And in fact, I would say even Nandala eventually benefited from her being here. So everybody benefited and he got other artists from the West to come. They were welcome and which also helped somebody like Ram Kinkar to emerge. So he did play some role, but he also had immense faith in the abilities of Nandalal. And that I think was right. I mean, instead of interfering with him to give him that freeway, but also nudge uh, whenever it was necessary. So what you're saying is that his ideas and ideals were there yeah. and he kind of left it to others to carry them forward. Yes. And the way it was carried forward by different people in different departments and yes. different sections is, is uh, has to do with them the, that, more than with, with Robin Ross yes, himself. That's right. Yeah. Very nice. Well, I think uh, all that uh, I can say more as a layman is that the kind of, you know, one thing leads to the other. We were talking about Kalab, uh, Kalab Bhavan and then we went into Sangeet Bhavan, then we went into Tagore, we went into his getting people so that others could benefit. Now, that is a vision which we, it's, it's beyond us, absolutely beyond us. But it is good that, you know, we are still talking about it and there will be ways and means to, you know, uh, implement many of his visions despite these issues that we have been talking about Externally, we are also aware, but that's what it is. And uh, I must thank both of you all for this wonderful session, because in more ways than one, you all have actually not only given us the chronological growth of uh, certain of Kala Bhavan particularly and Tagore as a whole, but also it has been so clearly spelled out that uh, I would um, like to send the final edited version of this recording uh, to a lot of schools on my own, you know, just a part of Kahani Kanjiti saying that, please see to, to the to the principals and the administrators, see this, this is for the, because that will give you a larger picture of Tagore itself. So thank you very much for both of you all to have come on to join this show. Uh, and uh, Shushantada, I think what we'll do is that I remembered that uh, doing Tagore uh, that uh, Dr. Martin Kemchen had talked about, I will try and now rework on the logo and, you know, bring talking Tagore is doing Tagore. That's what how it will look. Thank you very much for being with us. And I this will be, I'll uh, we, we'll get back to you and meet you all sometime soon. Thank yeah, you. and both of us would thank like you. to thank uh, Kahani yeah. Kancharti. I mean, yeah. I speak on behalf of Shiva Kumar as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Amar Mukti Aloy Aloy.